After a chaotic launch marked with server issues, a tsunami of critics, and waves of angry fans, Suicide Squad killed the Justice League is far from the worthy successor to the Batman Arkham series we all expected. To be perfectly honest, while gamers can be fussy nowadays, this time the hate is absolutely justified. There's a lot of things to discuss with this game, a lot of very bad things. Don't get me wrong, it does have its perks, but at the top of Rocksteady's pile of mistakes there's one glaring error that might just be unrecoverable and unforgivable. Well, let's talk about one of the worst cases of destroyed heritage ever seen since the destruction of the Great Library of Alexandria, or worse, since the release of Dragon Ball Super. Here are the six reasons why Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League will go down as the worst game in Rocksteady history. Let's begin by spitting a fact. Regardless of the final product, this game was a great idea. Despite being released in 2024, Justice League Kill the Suicide Squad is actually an old project. The very first mention of a Suicide Squad game was in 2010 by DC Comics, and the OGs all remember a post credit scene from Batman Arkham Origins which shows Deathstroke recruitment by Amanda Waller. That looks like a teaser to me. But it also pisses me off for two reasons. One, it was a bold move. Remember, at the time, the 2016 Suicide Squad movie wasn't released yet, and the whole superhero mediatic hype was far from what we have today. Two, the Arkham series' central theme was the thin line between good and evil. For example, we saw the hero Bruce Wayne resist his inner evil until the end, and we saw the villain Poison Ivy sacrifice herself to save Gotham. The Suicide Squad are the perfect protagonist for such a nuanced storytelling. So, this means they had an authentic, cool idea, but they still managed to fail miserably. Not to mention, they had plenty of time to make a decent plot with engaging storylines. Instead, fans were served disrespectful garbage which went as far as it could have from their expectations. In summary, Rocksteady took a promising idea and reduced it to nothing. But this makes me wonder, how do you miss the mark by this much when you have a good product, a good idea, and so many fans' expectations? A wise man once said, the bigger the expectation, the greater the disappointment. As we all know, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is not your average release in the year. It's one of the most anticipated games of the decade, and justifiably so. We are talking about the Batman Arkhamverse's long-awaited return. A nine-year-long loading screen during which the Arkham series was cemented as the greatest series in superhero gaming history. The stakes were high, and the shoes were very big to fill. But just how big were they? We might not realize how this game's failure might badly affect the gaming landscape. As we all know, the history of superhero games is made of tragedies and triumphs. And among those triumphs, very few can compare to the sacrosanct Batman Arkham series. I gotta tell you, it was perfect. Perfect. Everything, down to the last minute details. From Arkham Asylum in 2009 all the way to the climactic Arkham Knight in 2015, each of the titles were just as good as the last, and with the Arkham series, Rocksteady Studios went from unknown Padawans to Grandmaster Jedis in the art of making historically good games. To this day, Batman Arkham Knight still holds up pretty well to any recent superhero game despite being 9 years old at this point. Just to put things into perspective and to illustrate just how steep Suicide Squad killed the Justice League's fall from grace is, I want you to realize that these games were released at a time when making a lore-accurate open-world Batman game was seen the same way as making a decent Superman game today. Impossible. But it wasn't just the open world. The entire atmosphere transported us back to the finest pages of the Dark Knight comics with top-tier graphics, and the gameplay was always on point whether it was during the stealth phases or the melee sequences. For anybody who never played one of these games, imagine just standing alone on the top of a gargoyle, with raindrops hitting the bat's cape, observing a dark, vulnerable Gotham City right before skydiving directly inside the Batmobile, and free roam to fight crime as the Vengeance, the Knight, the Batman. In 2009, such a gaming experience with the Dark Knight was a fantasy, a transgenerational gamer dream that was said to be impossible, and nobody was crazy enough to try. But Rocksteady Studios not only made the impossible, but they made a four-game series out of it. In today's industry, where most publishers are scared to invest in risky games, this is the kind of game you don't want to see fail, because it kind of says to everybody else, you should stick to your ground, not try to do the impossible. That's how this game could affect the gaming landscape. And nonetheless, after nine years in the Gotham Knight disaster in 2022 as an appetizer, ending up as one of the greatest superhero games ever made was the minimum fans asked from Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League. But once again, some shoes are just too big to be filled. That didn't stop Rocksteady Studios from making big promises, though. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League's main selling argument wasn't Harley Quinn, or the Suicide Squad, or Metropolis, but its statue as the long-awaited next installment in the Arkhamverse, and a canon sequel to Batman Arkham Knight. By making this choice, Rocksteady made the we'll give the people what they want promise. 
and just like in politics, the very wicked one. As we are about to see, this simple promise might have cost them their entire legacy. But before we get into the spicy criticizing part, let's give the credit where it's due. Under the David vs. Goliath face-off between the Suicide Squad and the Justice League, there was an opportunity to see other main heroes debut in the Arkhamverse, with many easter eggs and cameos for the devoted fans to spot. From a gameplay standpoint, four playable characters that are not demigods could have succeeded where Marvel's Avengers failed in 2022, making a balanced and fun cooperative superhero game. Also, this time from a narrative standpoint, there's so much more story to tell with four villains that we don't know rather than a hero we do know. To continue with what works about the game, it has its fair share of qualities. While the graphics and open world are far from the apex of where Batman Arkham Knight was, the rotting corpse of Metropolis is a pretty nice place to roam in, and the fact that each character has his own gameplay and movement mechanic makes it even better. Especially during the day, when the game is actually good looking. The combat gameplay isn't all that bad either, especially during melee sequences. And while many will say the contrary, the scenario isn't actually that bad if you look at it with an objective eye, untampered by nostalgia. What I'm trying to say here is there was so, so, so much more to do with this game, and there's brilliant ideas here and there. I'm particularly thinking about the Batman Museum sequence, which is a great testament to the Arkham timeline and allows us to know what happens to Bruce after his cataclysmic end in Arkham Knight. Honestly, this game had all the elements to live up to its hype. But, unfortunately, the gaming gods once again taught us a harsh lesson. Never get overhyped for a game. Especially if, one, it's a live service game with microtransactions everywhere, two, its developers refuse to give early game keys to the press for review but don't mind a paid early access, and three, it's a January release because I really believe Forspoken casted a curse for AAA games within this month. Oh, and just in case you haven't guessed it, welcome to the part where the nuance stops and I can finally unleash my rage on Rocksteady Studios. Buckle up! Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is by far a much more painful deception than being left at the altar. Why? Because being left at the altar is hitting rock bottom, and this game hits rock bottom repeatedly, and keeps going back for more. The gameplay is a repetitive loop, and like I said, there are some interesting mechanics, but the whole game design, the missions, everything just pushes you to play the same way, which is shooting from the mid-range till the end of times like DeMar DeRozan. Think of it, of all the clips you watch from this game, how many times was it just any character shooting at people with these disgusting damage numbers popping out? And the missions are always the same thing. Whether you're playing the main quest or the recycled mess they call side quests, you are always doing the same thing, and none of them are any fun at all. I don't remember how many times I had to defend positions, escort slow vehicles, or pick random people up. The only moment you'll feel a change is during boss fights, but they're not all that better. As a highly skilled gamer, none of these boss fights offered a challenge nor a single ounce of fun. Honestly, it's just purely annoying, especially against the Flash. It's quite evident we are miles away from the Arkham series storytelling and creativity with boss fights. Who else remembers how the whole gameplay changed when facing Scarecrow or the Joker? And I'm sorry to shoot at the ambulance, but can we talk about these deja vu mechanics? It's been four years since Marvel Avengers and Rocksteady Studios, out of all people, served us the same formula that we've already seen two or three times. Well, of course, playing with friends can make things a little better, but it's really just a little. You have a lot of funnier things to play with your friends for far less than the game's $70 price tag. This includes Batman Arkham Knight, which, if you play it now, feels like an upgrade from Suicide Squad rather than its prequel. At this point, some of you might wonder how the clunky gameplay alone could destroy the Arkham series legacy. And it's a good question. So, let's ditch the gameplay and start talking about the scenario. The main reason why everybody is bashing the game. Disclaimer, spoilers are going to be common from this point forward, so please stay with me. I'm gonna save you some valuable time by exposing how the game's writing is a straight insult both to fans and what the series built. Like I said, the main plot idea isn't all that bad. You have to kill the Justice League. But why? Because Brainiac, one of the most intelligent antagonists in the DC Universe, has brainwashed them and made them instruments to his tyrannical plans. So now the world is in danger, and since the heroes are all gone, only the bad guys of the Suicide Squad are available to save everybody. But when you put a story where the bad guys are the protagonists, it doesn't work when they just stay as evil as they were as the antagonists. And just to clarify what I mean by evil, there's one scene where I felt my soul leave my body and go haunt everyone from the development team. See? This, this right here is what I'm talking about. This scene where Boomerang gets his junk out and pees on the Flash's course while other members of the Suicide Squad actually congratulate him for the size of his package, instead of telling him to put his thing back in his pants. What the actual hell? This scene is so cringe that I have to wonder who actually had this idea and who had the audacity to approve it. This scene embodies the whole issue with the game, the disrespect. Not just to the characters, but also to the players, and to the game itself. Let me show you an example where this works. 
You see the difference? Basically, if you want the audience to love an evil protagonist, it's better to make him unleash his evilness on somebody the public doesn't care about, otherwise just let him be the antagonist. Here, all of the Justice League members are utterly disrespected. Of course, they're all brainwashed, but that doesn't mean it's not them. Maybe they forgot that we all know each of these guys' backstories by heart, and thus, each time you write a story about a hero loved by the public, you have to treat them the right way, even when they are promised a tragic fate. Rocksteady didn't really bother with that. Each one of our heroes dies a pathetic and anecdotal death, comparable to a Goomba in Super Mario falling off the ledge right after being stomped on. You feel nothing after killing the Justice League, nothing but anger and shock. There is a rule in writing called Willing Suspension of Disbelief. This basically implies that if you do something in your story, it has to be believable. And I personally don't believe that the Justice League could die that easily. Which is a major red flag for a game called Kill the Justice League. And when you think it can't get any worse, there's some moments where you legitimately question if the writers have ever opened a single DC comic in their life. For instance, we all know that at the moment a Green Lantern dies, his ring instantly leaves his body and goes to the closest worthy wearer nearby. The wearer must then take the Green Lantern Oath before being able to use the ring's power. Well, when Jon Stewart is killed in the game, King Shark actually takes his ring and temporarily uses it like it was meant for him. This is not Lord of the Rings! And to stress things out further, the Justice League member's death is followed by nothing special. It's literally like, they're dead. Muzzle off, on to the next one. That's why I mentioned disrespectful garbage earlier. We actually waited nine years for a clumsy story filled with cringe moments. But there is still one character who's actually treated the right way, which is Wonder Woman. She is the only one not affected by the brainwashing, and thus Lee allies with the Suicide Squad before dying at the hands of Superman while trying to protect everyone. This pisses me off for two reasons. One, if they have the writing skills to treat a character properly, why did they only do justice to Wonder Woman? And two, Dear Rocksteady, of all the people in the Justice League, of all the characters you ever worked on in the Arkham timeline, isn't there anyone, anyone, who deserved it more than Diana Prince? This brings us to maybe the biggest problem of the game. Clearly, the focal point of the fans' disappointment. Rocksteady Studios' kiss of Judas on the fans' cheek. Batman. I can't find accurate words to describe both how badly Batman's character is treated in the game, and how disastrous it is for the Arkham universe. Like I said, this game is canon to the Arkham timeline, so this Bruce Wayne is the same one we controlled in the previous Arkham games. This is mind-blowing. First things first, how in all heavens does somebody we all saw overcoming insane doses of the Scarecrow toxin while literally being possessed by the Joker's ghost just get brainwashed that easily without even showing a glimpse of resistance? And while the idea of seeing Bruce Wayne who fought so hard to repel his inner demons turn evil was interesting, there is not a single narrative idea exploited from it. Even with Harley Quinn around, there's nothing special going on. Remember how I mentioned the Suicide Squad's insane plot armor earlier? Well, against Batman, it's actually even worse. We've seen this version of Batman take out eight elite assassins in one night. This includes Deathstroke, who was supposed to be in the Suicide Squad, meaning he's probably on par with them. This Batman, just like the one from the Legion of Doom movie, had crafted effective plans to kill each member of the Justice League. At one point in the game, the Suicide Squad actually follows Batman's plans to beat their foes, with that in mind, considering he had some prep time before facing these four idiots, how was he defeated? How? But the worst part remains his death. The glaring error on top of everything else, the perfect example of how to destroy an immaculate legacy. Do you remember how bravely Bruce accepted to break his secret and retire by faking his death through the Nightfall Protocol? Well, after nine long years of wondering what happens to him, this is how his story ends. Yeah, you're not dreaming. One of the best ever incarcerations of the Dark Knight dies. An irrelevant death, sitting on a bench in a park, and gets shot in the head by Harley Quinn, of all people. This Batman story arc is a total insult and destruction to what the Arkham games built. The idea of Batman simply returning as a vigilante, moving to Metropolis with the whole world aware of his real identity is so out of character. Hell, we all saw Batman say farewell to everybody in Arkham Knight's ending, accepting that Batman is no more. Now we're supposed to believe he forgot his own word and doesn't even mind a little exposure like a museum in his honor? This is Bruce Wayne, not Tony Stark. And not to mention, Rocksteady, this character is your masterpiece. This character put you on the map. This character is your noblest contribution to the gaming history books, and this is how you send him off. Not to mention that this was unfortunately one of Kevin Conroy's last interpretations of the Dark Knight. It's amazing to think they could have just put him in Wonder Woman's place in the narrative scheme but they still decided that this was the right way to send off Batman. I really don't want to know what they do to characters they don't think about. Don't get me wrong, killing Batman or any other member of the Justice League is not the problem. The problem is how it's done. 
Why couldn't they have done a scene with Batman turning back into his normal self and asking to be killed? Or make him sacrifice himself instead of being shot like a wounded dog? Why couldn't they make Harley Quinn reluctant to kill him, just to make the scene more dramatic or impactful? Bruce Wayne is just a man, but when it comes to killing the Batman, you don't do it like this. Especially when it ruins years of greatness. Overall, why, how, and huh are the perfect summary words of how we feel about this game. Let's end this with the horrible reason behind this fiasco. See, it all magically uncovers itself in the ending. You finally lay a hand on Brainiac, and before he transforms into the Flash so that the final boss fight is actually a more annoying ripoff of the most annoying boss fight in the game, you discover that there are 13 alternative versions of Brainiac in different universes all working together to enslave all of creation. Which means, everything you've been doing was pointless. You are not at the ending, but in the beginning. But I wonder, why make that choice? Why make a choice that enhances the game's lifetime and makes a larger window for continuity and more content? Oh, I get it now. Rockstar, you pesky little rascals. That's why it's a live service game, right? This is why the campaign was so short and the missions were so repetitive. The game isn't finished yet. This is merely season one. And for God knows how many more seasons, you'll be releasing DLCs with new characters, new cosmetics, new missions, and the remainder of the story with the 12 other Brainiacs. You already took $70 from us, and now you plan to get 100 more bucks. This is genius! Even Square Enix didn't go that low when they had the frickin' Avengers. But you forgot one small detail in your plan. This is not 2015, and gamers are not as stupid as EA still thinks they are. Most of us know when we're being fooled, and who fools us. We just didn't know Rocksteady Studios would be one of them someday. This is not what you gave us before, and this is certainly not the game we've been asking for for the last nine years. But to be fair, with Rocksteady, who can blame them? In today's gaming market, how do you make a good game when you have to reboot it several times mid-development? How do you produce a good result when your founders and directors leave the company in a crucial step of the development process? How do you give a good send-off to your most important character? And of course, in such conditions when your game is published by Warner Bro Games, how can you not join the dark side of live game service to make a profitable product? What I'm trying to say is, the Rocksteady Studios that produced the original Arkham series is no more, and I'm convinced that the Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League ended up far from their own initial plans. Like I said, the game has its qualities and I'm sure some will defend it, but it's hard to imagine anything they could do to save the game or undo the damage they've done to the Arkhamverse and the fans' loyalty but only time will tell how far this game can go. Plus, this wouldn't be the first time a Justice League media gets saved from sinking. In conclusion, I could simply say, that's all folks, now you know why we already hate this game! But, let's go a little bit further. Yes, we are forever indebted to Rocksteady Studios for making the Batman Arkham series, and back then, it seemed easy to just say, can you imagine how much greater the games will be in 10 years? But, here we stand 10 years later, mourning over the past like always as if developers are always the ones to blame. Maybe this devolution in quality and this new trend of disappointing anticipated games is another symptom of a greater sickness that slowly consumes our industry. Maybe Batman Arkham Knight was so great because it was developed at the right time, at a better state for the whole gaming economy. If that's the case, how many more disasters like this are going to happen before things start to change for the better? Let us know what you think down in the comments, and as always, thanks for watching.